unfortunately, I've uh, never spent any of my training years in Malaysian uh, medical institution. Uh, I went to Edinburgh, and then uh, I was in Aberdeen, and I did my registrar training and became an endocrinologist in Aberdeen. And I went back as an associate professor and professor in, in University of Malaya. Then I went to Penang. Uh, so, you know, I, I'll, I'm s telling you about the uh, career training, mainly from the outside, you know, being the uh, as a assessor of, say, uh, a consultant looking after interns in University of Malaya and in Penang, uh, and do, you know, examining people who do the MRCP there or doing the Masters in Medicine. But I think you know I can give you a fair uh, assessment from from the outside. Right, I think you all know the Far East. Uh, a lot of you look as though you come from the Far East. Uh, so uh, you know I don't have to tell you. Where would you be interested in, in the Far East uh, to do internship at least? Um, I think it's probably unlikely that many will want to do internship in Myanmar, Indonesia, into China, but. I think in terms of working there at subsequent level, uh, it would probably provide a very good sort of professional experience, uh, but I cannot uh, tell you what it's like to be trained in those places. Most of my talk will be about Malaysia, but I will mention a bit about Singapore and Hong Kong. I think Singapore is uh, a nice place to be. Uh, it's English speaking civilized. I always think that they are too civilized. Uh, you know, they don't cross the road when there's no cars because there's no green man, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, and, and I think they're probably because they get fined for doing uh, silly things like that. That's why they say about Singapore being a fine city, because you, you get fined for anything that you, <laughs> that you do that's not appropriate. And the remuneration is it's good there. At one time, it was so much better than Malaysia. A lot of our students were going to Singapore because it's getting better paid. But I must tell you that the Ministry of Health has increased the the, uh, uh, the pays for junior doctors in Malaysia as well. The standard of medicine is high. Uh, I think it's not as high as they think in terms of they always compare themselves to Malaysia, which quite often grates on my nerves. But uh, it is, you know, it's high. But I think the level of training is good. Uh, the there is, you know, and this is improving in Malaysia. But in terms of internship training, the Singaporean uh, hospitals, uh, you know, uh, have a very good structured training of interns. And this is what my students uh, gone there said. And a lot of them work very hard and come back having lost a lot of weight. So they must work very hard, either that or they cannot afford the food there. Uh, Singapore suffers from the fact that it has a limited number of housemanship training. Uh, and I think it suffers from a lot of administrative errors in terms of projection of how much training post they have. And they've made changes in their policy because of this. Um, so at one time, uh, they did not recognize Irish degree. They only recognized the UK one. And then because of shortage, they, they opened up and recognized Irish degrees, UK degrees, and obviously Australian. And then they found that their numbers are more than enough. And, and they started limiting to not allow uh, interns to come in if they've done a, what they call a tuning program like PMC, which is you know really quite sad for a lot of our students who want to go there, especially uh, our non-Malaysian ones. Uh, they did not do this as, you know, as a sort of matter of reflection of standards, because at the same time, they open up internship to Malaysians who go to UM or UKM, being the two most oldest medical school, rather than the best. You know, you, you, know, you go to USM, UPM people, they will argue that probably their degree is as good. So they're, they're not. So the Singapore, they'll probably change again in terms of policy administratively. 
So there are some changes in terms of uh, doors opening and closing uh, in Singapore. But I think it's best if you want to find out is to check with the you know, Singapore Medical Council policy. There's some differences uh, in terms of the pathways if you're a fresh medical graduate or you're a practicing non-specialist. I think it's best that uh, you know you, you get this into your, you know, yourself, but as I said, to, to get as a fresh medical graduate internship, uh, there are some limitations unless you come from you know, uh, Irish medical school, not the twinning program, uh, UK, Australia, or, or uh, Canada. If you are non, uh, practice non-specialist with a recognized degree, uh, then you, you, know, you, you get a job first, then you can apply to be uh, recognized by the Singapore Medical Council. That's not a problem, and I think you can get this on the website. So I won't go into great details, but you know, this would be, I think, on Moodle. Yeah. So you, know, you can get uh, details from the, from the uh, Singapore Medical Council about the various rules and regulations and uh, details about employment from the two main uh, employing, employment agencies, SingHealth or uh, NHG. Singapore uh, and Hong Kong, uh, again, they have a licensing exam. You, you are medical graduates other than Hong Kong U or Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, and this is at least quite straightforward. You know, you, you're a graduate from elsewhere. Cisco kid is here. Uh, then you just apply for the licensing exam, and the Academy of Medicine there have what's happening here uh, has statutory power to organize, monitor, assess. Just, just minimize it rather than try to close it. Uh, okay. Uh, has statutory power to organize, monitor, assess, and accredit all medical specialist training. Again. It's much better if you're interested in Hong Kong to look up the Hong Kong Academy of Medicine. Okay, Malaysia. <coughs> uh, most of you are Malaysians, yes. I heard uh, earlier the you know a lot of Malaysian. I mean, I, I get it from our students as well. They they want to apply to, in Ireland internship and. There are great difficulties currently because of the one city application and uh, uh, administrative rules like uh, you know being EU and non-EU. That one we, we don't have much uh, much we can do about it. Unfortunately, Ministry of Health Malaysia also now have rules that it is very difficult for non-Malaysians to to get an internship uh, in in Malaysia. So this is why, for a while now, we we stop admitting uh, non-Malaysians uh, unless they, you know, understand that this is a limitation. Uh, because the only way you can get a job in an internship level, I'm not talking about subsequent level, uh, is you either Malay, uh, no, marry a Malaysian, or uh, uh, the second way is for you your own country to provide recommendations that you must do your housemanship training where you, you do your medical undergraduate training. Even there, I've got a Korean student having great difficulty uh, having this uh, going through the, this route uh, with the Ministry of Health. So, you know, the alternative is for me to op open a, a marriage uh, sort of uh, <laughs> bureau in, in PMC for non malaysians I think the problem is that the intern post number around 1,500 only. Uh, it was 1,300, and it's gone up a bit recently. But again, the, the Malaysian Ministry of Health do not speak so you know, closely to the Ministry of Higher Education, and they really do not know how many people are training abroad, uh, especially those that go on their own to Russia, Ukraine, and places like that. So really, they, they have suddenly a glut of people come back with a medical degree that they did not you know expect so therefore the forecast in terms of having uh, intern uh, trainings hospitals are way behind uh, what, what have they done about the glut of interns now they've 
started shift work system uh, for internship uh, and also utilizing certain hospitals that are yet not classified as intern training hospitals for part of their training. Uh, I mean, it is obviously uh, understandable that for a hospital to be considered intern training, you must have various, you know, things in place. Radiology, good radiology service, pathology, uh, a lot of CME, you know, that sort of thing. And some of the smaller hospitals, uh, still labeled as high-level district hospitals, do not are not used for internship training. And although there are quite a lot of hospitals that are good, they may not yet be classified as internship training. But as I said, the Ministry of Health are starting to use them under supervision uh, as part of the uh, internship training. So the, in, the shift work system for interns have just started. Uh, I gather it's going quite well. Uh, but like all shift work, I think the key thing is in terms of handover. You know, I think medical people need to learn from the nurses. I think nurses do handover all the time. So as far as I know, it's going quite well. This is because, you know, before they had this internship, uh, this shift work program, there were so many interns per ward that they were just milling around, you know, like Brownian movement, you know, without uh, much purpose. Uh, and, and therefore, this would dilute the uh, you know, uh, clinical experience. So th that's something f you know, for Malaysians who are going back uh, that to expect. Okay, how, how do you get an uh, internship place? As I said now, uh, the, there are problems for those who are non-Malaysians, although you know, they have a recognized degree. Uh, therefore, uh, they, they have to apply. Uh, they must, their medical school must be recognized by the Malaysian Medical Council. The, you know, there is a, a list, you know, obviously uh, RCSI, you know, all NUI degrees are recognized and so is PMC. And then you apply through the Malaysian Medical Council. Nowadays the uh, internship is for at least two years. Why at least? Uh, there are some interns who obviously have to be extended. Uh, this is uh, because of, you know, um, because of poor performance, usually uh, due to, you know, I don't know. I mean, there are some, I've asked my ex-graduates uh, who, you know, because they, they, every time I meet them, uh, as far as I know, none of the our graduates, PMC graduates at least, have had to be extended in any internship, but there are some coming from East European countries uh, where the training is not so clinically uh, intense uh, that they have had problems during internship had to be extended and extended. So after at least two years of training, they can apply for full registration and then get an APC, uh, uh, annual practicing certificate, which obviously needs to be renewed uh, every year. But that's automatic after, you know, if you keep your nose clean during your, your job. And then they become a medical officer. There is, a, for Malaysians, a, a compulsory government service for two further years uh, after uh, internship before they can be sort of uh, uh, gazetted as, as a med medical officer before you can go out and do private practice, that is. So this is one way where the Ministry of Health hospitals can keep themselves well staffed. Eh? So, you know, it's, it's an understandable thing. Uh, so initially two years as intern and then two years as medical officer before you finish and then you can go out and do private practice if you want or you can, you know, uh, continue your various training for whatever subspecialty you think. In the two years, uh, there are six, four monthly postings. And obviously the, the main one, medicine, surgery, ONG, pediatrics, orthopedic, AME. Uh, as you see here, you know, in, in, I mean, this is why we've modified our in a clinical training in uh, PMC because of this emphasis in in Malaysia for orthopedics, ONG and a and &E, now that you know, we've made sure we strengthen the undergraduate training in anticipation of them 
going through this uh, in internship rotation. <clears throat> so what happens after internship? Well, you, you can get various postgraduate qualifications uh, as a registrar or medical officer. Some people choose the uh, Royal Colleges routes. You know, various uh, professional colleges offer uh, professional diplomas and degrees. Uh, MRCP, MRCS, MRCP, uh, CH, and MRCOG, etc. But the rules are obviously as per each colleges, you know, like that's part one, part two, A, and then PACES, etc. Uh, there are some of the Royal College exams can be done locally. Uh, MRCP UK, uh, we, when I was in University of Malaya, we started doing it. I mean, still run this. The uh, secretary is still in uh, UC Malaya. So the part two, the, the, the paces can be done in, in Malaysia once a year, in Singapore uh, once a year. So at least you don't have to travel to UK to do MRCP uh, if you don't want to. MRCPI, uh, there is an opportunity to do one MRCPI exams per year. It's run out of Kuala Lumpur, although there's talk of maybe PMC being involved a bit more in this. MRCS, I think part of the exam is done uh, in PMC, etc. Uh, MRCP child health as well can be done locally. For those who are not wanting to go down to MRCP route, although you know a lot of them probably do both in, in terms of MR, the MRCP type thing, or the uh, Malaysian uh, Malaysian University Masters program uh, called Masters of Medicine. Uh, and you can only do this after getting your compulsory service and getting yourself confirmed in, in the government service. So there are various master's programs which put you in the first step of, say, medicine, surgery, pediatrics, etc. Although there are now master's programs offered by some uh, in, say, neurosurgery, where it's really not just specialty but subspecialty at the master's level. Only USM. Uh, University of Science Malaysia in Kota Baru offers neurosurgery as a master's program. All the others, you know, you have to do a master's in medicine first before you can do cardiology or etc. Initially, just the three main public universities, UM, University of Malaya, University of Kubangsan, Malaysia, and University of Science Malaysia were involved in the master's in medicine program. And indeed, they still control the, uh, uh, the, the program uh, the administration of the program um, by the conjoint board. You know, the district the medical schools plus the uh, Academy of Medicine are involved in the conjoint board. But now, you see Malaysia Sabah and UPM are also offering master's program in public health, etc. When it first started, the master's of medicine program were only in house, which means you must spend time in you see Malaysia, you see Kubangsan, you see Science Malaysia teaching hospitals. There are the only three medical schools in Malaysia that have their own teaching hospital. But because, you know, this was unpopular with Ministry of Health. Imagine, you know, if you are MO in Alastar or somewhere, you have to leave Alastar for three years, you know, to go to Kuala Lumpur or, or Kota Baru. And uh, this hosp teaching hospitals, you know, benefit, but Ministry of Health lose you for three years. Uh, because you, you, you're on study leave, they cannot replace you. So it's very unpopular with the Ministry of uh, Health hospitals. So now a lot, some of this can be done off campus. You know? So if you're doing master's medicine, medicine surgery, some of your training, say in the first year or first two years, can be done in your own hospital, provided that there are somebody there that can do the supervision. You know? For instance, when I'm in Penang, I'm, since I've been in Penang, I've been able to, you know, for the master's uh, medicine program, they can do their uh, endocrine training with me. So they don't have to do endocrine in UM or USM, UKM. And the same for respir respiratory and things like that. So it is possible for you to remain in your parent hospital if there is a trainer or a supervisor available. The problem with the master's of medicine is that it is only a local currency, you know, you, you cannot at present, uh, you know, you cannot use it, say, to, to work elsewhere. So a lot of people are worried and therefore do um, MRCP as well. You know, the training is similar. So you, you're in an MAP program, you can do MRCP quite easily. 
I examined both MRCP UK examination, although I stopped for the last couple of years. I've had enough after so many years. But I still examine in the uh, masters. We examine the masters at a much higher level than MRCP because the masters is an exit exam and MRCP is really an entrance exam to training. So with MRCP, it's international currency. <clears throat> what about the red tape? I think Malaysia is famous for the red tape. It probably should export red tape to Russia in the past, you know, in the past anyway. But uh, the, so some of the ways of you know making red tape less of a burden is maybe to do uh, certain things like if you want to maybe get because the masters can be quite competitive. Uh, and but they do you know if you work in your internship say you know you when you apply for internship you say I got no pre you know, no preferences and you get sent to Sabah Sarawak do not go and pull pull strings to get out of that rotation working in Sabah Sarawak may in fact give you an advantage because you might be given a you know, due consideration for entry to the masters because you've done your due you know gone. Uh, <coughs> Uh, then, then after after you've done your masters, you can get a gazetteman as a specialist, internal medicine, surgery, or whatever. Uh, six months after finish your masters, but if you do MRCP, it, it takes a bit longer before you're gazetted uh, in the. So there are some pain. You know, people call ask ask me, what's the difference? Uh, MRCP you obviously do at your own pace. Pace, unfortunately, your MRCP training is very much. You know, there's no structure. Uh, so it's a bit opportunistic. Whereas, say, in uh, Masters, there's very good structured training. You know, I, you go through uh, one year of basic internal medicine and then three months of, you know, most of the specialty, you know, uh, eight of the 11, you know, dermatology, cardiology, endocrinology, nephrology. So you come out really quite right around it. And in fact, in the masters, the fourth year is uh, there's an elective for six months where you can do extra six months in whichever specialty you might want to do later, uh, subspecialty, say endocrinology or gastroenterology, and that six months is recognised as part of your subspecialty training. Mm -hmm. And then you also expect to do research. So there are quite a good research training in, embedded into the masters program. And afterwards, a shorter wait. Uh, Okay, uh, after that, after getting your, then you, you might want to do a, a subspecialty rotation. There is a, you know, various Ministry of Health training fellowship for subspecialty, respiratory, gastroenterology, etc. Uh, and surgery, they have uh, various subspecialty as well within surgery. Unfortunately, they take a, a further three years you know, for Masters of Medicine. Uh, somebody say Masters of Medicine, MRCP. Then after examination, they apply to the say endocrine subspecialty. There's a three years subspecialty training uh, within the uh, Ministry of Health, of which usually in the third year you, you get uh, sent abroad uh, to do one year, uh, paid you know as part of the. Uh, there is still a scholarship to you know that pay you for for the, for the last year of uh, subspecialty training abroad. So, you know, you can get quite good training. A lot of people say they, they get quite old by the time they finish because of this weight, you know, the resentment. The, we, we've discussed this, the Academy of Medicine. We're trying very hard to cut down some of these, you know, periods of the, the ministry say you must do so much compulsory this, compulsory his. You know, you must do this and get gazetted for several years before you can do subspecialty. Hopefully, by the time some of you come back, uh, you know, but then you were ready to do subspecialist training. I think the, the time frame might be shorter. There is a national specialist register uh, for various subspecialists, for various, say, like there's internal medicine and endocrinology, very much like what was mentioned about, you know, at the stage. You, you do one and then the other. Uh, so you can get in the N N national specialist register in you know, uh, general medicine as well as respiratory medicine. or if you want to be just a respiratory medicine alone, you, you can. So if you're a new trainee, you know, you, you're training here or you're training in Malaysia, a new trainees have 
less difficulty getting registered because I still don't know a National Special Register for Endocrinology. People who've just gone through a training will have fresh logbook. They have their you know, reports from their supervisors, uh, references. A lot of them are public published, and it's very, very easy to, to get uh, NSR uh, registration. The problem is for people who've been in you know, endocrinology a long time before. So that's the apply to you all. So if you're going to be, say, a, you know, a physician or an endocrinologist, make sure you have logbooks and reports of your rotation that you keep them safe for application later. You can look up again about uh, the National Special Register and the Academy of Medicine. Uh, uh, and eventually, uh, once you know they, they have all the subspecialty and specialty uh, tied down, it will be uh, compulsory for you to be registered on NSR before you, you can do your job, either in government or private sector. OK, it's just a, uh, a rough thing to say, in, uh, to, to summarize what I said. Internship, basic training, intermediate training, and then you get a high special training and consultant. So in Malaysia, is internship, compulsory service. So therefore, after four years, you're uh, gazetted as a doctor. Then you have your intermediate training, then you do MRCP, and then you can do your subspecial training. Some people who uh, want to go through university posts might start doing research early uh, during your uh, uh, so specialist period after your M being at MO, and then get your uh, you know, MD or PhD. It does help, especially if you intend to go and do uh, a work in the teaching hospital. If not, uh, by going through this uh, first pathway here, you can end up as a consultant uh, in, in government service. Just an overview. Uh, I think there is a problem about you know, policies against non-nationals, and this is mainly for interns. Uh, for at other, play, at other levels, to come in as a medical officer, uh, you, you, it's fine if you are non-Malaysian. Uh, after you've done your internship, you can apply to become a medical officer uh, in government or university hospitals, and you can also get into the master's program from being a contract officer in the Ministry of Health or you know, university teaching hospital as a contract medical officer, you can apply to do the master's. So it is possible for non-Malaysians to come in, but it's the intern year that is very, very difficult. Uh, competitiveness, I think it's very highly competitive in medicine and surgery. But so far, I think some uh, rehab medicine is very low. Uh, family medicine should be picking up because of the planned reform in terms of financing of health services. They're going to need a lot more family medicine, but at present there's not enough uh, training posts. Okay, the problem I think is the length, length of the program. A lot of people say it'd be very much higher, you know, be around mid-30s before they can uh, get a specialist status, longer in some, like neurosurgery. Um, then you know you do your master's program, you exit as a specialist, and you still have to do a subspecialty. You know, so it's a very very long road. Uh, <clears throat> okay, I've mentioned most of these about trading abroad, uh, university giving opportunities. So what are the uh, options for foreign students? Possible, but more difficult for housemanship, and it's done on a case to case basis, but it's really quite difficult, uh, despite what they say. Women, there's no, uh, you know, uh, no problem. We don't discriminate against women. <laughs> uh, Students with families, I think some medical hospitals do have crash, but I think a lot of them prefer the in-laws looking after them. So I think if you want, you can get more information from the Ministry of Health website. Uh, unfortunately, I think the turnover in Ministry of Health is quite high because of the hemorrhage of specialists into the private sector. I think there is going to be more stabilization, say, in cardiology. But uh, you know, uh, there's always an opening in, in, you know, as a specialist in the Ministry of Health because of this hemorrhage. So most of the specialists in, you know, in Malaysian Ministry of Health hospital are, in fact, non-Malaysians on contract. Um, 
So this is why they're having special programs to, if you already have specialists abroad, you know, they, they, they try to woo you back with certain things like you can bring two cars, or, uh, you get all sorts of tax incentives. Okay, uh, quality program search for in medicine. Obviously, you need a recognized quali qualification. It helps to, if you're applying for you know, government hospital to speak uh, Malaysian language, Bahasa Malaysia. How you can improve your su suitabilities. Research uh, is becoming more important, especially if you're going to apply for university posts. As I mentioned, job options are plentiful, like graduate, specialist, senior level. Uh, now, desired specialists can, in fact, go into private hospitals without the three years compulsory service if your specialty is the desired one, you know, there's shortage. So at one time before, you, you must, you know, come and be a government specialist, a government doctor first, get a compulsory service. But now, certain specialty, you can get exemption and go straight into private hospital uh, without having to do the three years compulsory service. Training opportunities are increasing. Uh, as I mentioned, non-Malaysians can get post and join the master's program. So to sum up, uh, highlight again, it's difficult to get intern posts for non-Malaysians. Uh, post registration posts are available. And, uh, you know, as I said, a lot of non-specialist, especially posts in Malaysia, in the Ministry of Health are, are still non-nationals. So therefore, you know, because there would be a limited time, there still be a lot of posts coming out as they return home or their contracts are 